Hello all. Um, full disclaimer, this is my first official game dev presentation talk ever, so bear with me on it. But um, I'm Troy Maynard, and I'm giving a talk on uh, creating indie MMOs with Core. In this presentation, I'll um, say this might be a good spot here. So I gotta look. Right. Um, I'm gonna give you a little outline of what's going on. Uh, I'm gonna give you like my background real quick. Uh, what is Core? Because not everybody knows what Core is exactly yet. Um, kind of an overview, the interface, um, and then I have a lot of technical stuff about how to implement an MMO and like some of the lessons that I learned over the last year and a half trying to figure this out. And because um, it is like a brand new tool, so it's been an adventure. And um, but yeah, I know I was I was just told uh, recently somebody said I should cut out all the technical stuff, like all part of it, and make it more design oriented. So we can kind of steer this whatever way you guys want. I'm gonna try to go through it pretty quickly so we can have like a full 20 minutes for basically a hands-on interactive Q&A so everyone's free to ask like how do you do this and I can I'll have the actual project file open so I can demonstrate it pretty clearly um, and, uh, and I'm going to go over like the publishing process of pushing your game to core so it's live and then how to like maintain um, different branches and, and stage like your testing and stuff and then how to monitor and, and improve the experience for the players once the game is uh, published. Uh, yeah, two things. Like I said, it's kind of it's going to be a little more technical and it's slightly leaning towards being more like a workshop in a way. Um, so this talk does kind of assume that you have like pretty good like rudimentary knowledge of using other uh, popular common game engines like Unity or Unreal. Um, and um, some experience in multiplayer programming. If you don't, it's okay. Basically, I can summarize what I mean by that. It's just you have like your client and you have your server, and your server handles all the logical stuff, you know, making sure people aren't cheating and, and making sure people are where they're supposed to be, and the client kind of contains all the artwork and the sound effects and stuff and, uh, generally when you're making a multiplayer game. Um, all right, so my background real quick is uh, I used Unity in Unreal 4 for, for years, for most of the, la like the last decade. Did a bunch of jam games in Unity. I did um, an indie game in Unity for two years and actually showed it at ECGC in 2016. This was, this was that game, it was called Native. It was a little 2D side-scroller. Um, yeah, and then here's uh, the music blocks was something I got to work on in Fortnite Creative. That was fun. I made one of the first hip hop beats ever with it, and then it released, and then the community put my my little ditty to shame pretty quickly. Um, so, anyways, uh, I've been um, after working at Epic, I found Core in the fall of 2020, and I started working on uh, Puppet Masters, the game that I'm showing here uh, today. Um, Puppet Masters was part of Core's first grant program that they ran last summer, um, and uh, it was called the Accelerator. So that was fun. And uh, the game launched in September. It has a small community right now and is being updated every week, sometimes more often, like sometimes daily. And I'll show you guys how that's possible with Core in a minute. It's pretty cool. Um, so what is Core? Core is a UGC platform, user-generated content, or one of them metaverse things that everybody loves talking about. You know, it's um, basically like Roblox, if you guys know are familiar with Roblox concept or Fortnite creative or dreams um, where it's like this sandbox and this very easy easily accessible um, game engine basically for people to use and then they handle all the multiplayer stuff uh, and take that out of it for you so you get to like just focus on like gameplay and art and you're not dealing with like server maintenance or uh, database management or any of that stuff um, Players uh, arrive at a home world with portals to other games when first enter. That's what this looks like. We'll go hop over there in a second. Um, uh, game browser shows categories and thumbnails to enter other games. Some are looking at YouTube or an app store. So like this is what it looks like uh, when you're like browsing games. And um, it's built with Unreal Engine 4. So it literally, it's kind of like I jokingly call it like Unreal Engine Lite. Um, 
essentially. So they, they've got a lot of like the best features from Unreal, like the terrain sculpting, painting, all that stuff. And it's got a lot of, you know, if, if anyone's used Unreal, there's like a million options and checkboxes for every feature. And that it's really overwhelming as a new user. So they, they took all that and they kept like the rudimentary good parts of it and made it nice and simple and easy to use. Um, yeah, the, the create tool is there, easier to use, blah, blah. Um, I'll go hop over real quick. I'll show you guys what the home world looks like. So this is what it looks like when you first uh, log in. So you can see that's like a player list in the top left. So these are all other players that are live here in this, in this home world. It's spacebar and then you create here. And yeah, this is like, this is the home world. It's the daily chess thing. And uh, these are all portals to other games that are live right now. And you can just like fly through and hop into them. And um, yeah, they load pretty fast. And I'll get into why that's or how that's possible in a moment too. Here's uh, the game browser, right? So we're looking at active games. There's different categories, most engaging, whatever. And then you can like click like view all for most played and see them in, in order. Um, yeah, and then also probably something worth noting. We've got um, they've got like a character tab, and you got like half bars and stuff, kind of like Fortnite or something, and, and mounts. Mounts mounting's like built in. Um, and emotes are all built in and stuff, so you don't have to worry about any of that. And people can run around and dance all over your game and stuff without any extra effort on your part. <laughs> um, all right. So um, here's the pros and cons of it, real quick. Um, like I said, the, the, they're running dedicated servers for the games. It's totally free. If you were making a game on your own in Unreal or something, you'd have to pay upfront, like for AWS servers or Azure servers or something. Um, like, I'm actually, I am working on the Unreal Engine version of this game alongside it um, at the same time right now, and it's like we're having paid $30 a month just to even, like, host our source control for it and stuff, you know? So you don't have to do any of that. Um, record, it's all free. And yeah, auto scales. So if more people show up for the server than it can handle, then it, it keeps spinning up new instances and stuff. It's great. Uh, database management. Um, you know, people log into their account and they have data and stuff in your game that's persistent, that's tied to the account. You're not having to worry about any of that. Free use art and UI assets. So here's what some of them look like. Here's like some of the UI uh, icons that you get to use and some of the 3D models. There's like hundreds of both. Uh, there's free dev tools for analytics. Um, easy to implement multiplayer functionality. So again, like um, doing multiplayer in Unreal or Unity is a little bit like daunting and, and difficult, and they've packaged all that in, in a really nice way. Um, fast iteration publishing, uh, no maintenance downtime. So this is part of why I kind of go crazy and I'll, I'll push fixes and stuff almost daily because um, if you publish a new update, people are in the game, you just tell them like, hey, I'm pushing an update, and then it, after it finishes updating, they all get kicked temporarily, and there's like a continue button. They can just jump right back in instantly. So there's no maintenance downtime. You don't have to take servers down or anything, which is really nice. I actually published a, a fix for something with the leaderboards yesterday at the convention in like five minutes. Um, it was pretty critical. So uh, I can set up any sort of free to play monetization model you want. Um, you could like gate some of like. You could make your game pay to even like play it, but it wouldn't make a lot of sense when everybody else's games are free. Um, but yeah, you can set up like subscription models. You can set up um, like cosmetic purchases. Um, you can make it uh, pay to win Fiesta if you want. You know, uh, <laughs> payment processing is taken care of and it works internationally. So I have people buying battle passes in my game from all over uh, the world. Like it's pretty crazy. Um, Cons, it requires a decent Windows PC to run right now. Um, the min specs are kind of like a mid-level like desktop. It does not run well on laptops or anything yet, but uh, they are going to release it on iOS and Mac at the end of July, and in the process of achieving iOS, it should get really optimized. They, they just came out with a patch like, last week, and here's what, like the iPhone preview looks like that we got, the controls, and there was a substantial uh, jump in how optimized my game was too, and it was that patch, so that's good. Uh, there's 
one of the big downsides is there's no custom models or audio. So you're stuck with the 3D models and the audio that they give you in the box. Um, and part of the reason for that is because that is that is how the games are able to load like you're jumping between YouTube videos in like 10 to 30 seconds is because everybody has the same pool of, of assets and you're not downloading a bunch of new models and stuff every time you go to another game. So that's the reason for it. Um, we, they are giving us um, custom UI images like literally next week or week after um, with transparency and stuff. So at least you can do custom UI. Uh, you're limited to 32 players per server. Realistically, it's like 12 to 20 people per server if there's a lot going on. Um, 32 players is mostly achievable if it's just like a social like hangout lobby or something. I did like make a chess uh, lobby uh, last week uh, that supports 32 people and 16 chess games going at once because that's pretty lightweight. But um, yeah, I don't think that's a huge con though. I think you can still prove your proof of concept for a lot of 3D multiplayer games with 32 players pretty easily. Uh, it's a 50% split on all transactions, so that's how they pay for all this stuff, is um, they take half of the transaction money, but I would argue that it's totally worth it, and it's completely fair. Roblox takes 75%, which is terrible, and I don't think that's fair at all, but if you're looking at it compared to a traditional, like any game, Steam takes 30%. So it's really a 20% difference between Steam and Core, and to me that 20% is paying for all the servers and the staff and stuff that goes into maintaining and running all those servers and stuff for you. Um, here's the interface, I'm not gonna go this too uh, heavily, but if, again, if people use Unity or Unreal, it's pretty obvious. Um, uh, you've got like, um, you got tabs here for navigating scenes, which are basically maps that you wanna tie together. Um, these are like performance meters, so these let you know like if you're within the limitations. Um, your hierarchy is pretty standard, right? This is all the stuff that's present in like the world, like all the light posts or the UI or whatever. Uh, properties is like um, your typical like transform, like your position, your rotation, your scale, and then whatever whoop, whatever custom properties you want to add. Uh, to your stuff, and then your your content browser, like all other engines where you want to go grab new stuff to drop in or whatever. All right, um, so this is kind of weird, but I feel like it was important to make note of the limitations, like in the beginning, because um, knowing these limitations, it sort of is the reason why, like I ended up having to structure things the way that they are. Um, if that makes sense. So. The first one is pretty simple. It's this down here. Um, it's just normal object count. So every object, like like um, like those light posts, you know, they're they're kit bashed out of a bunch of cubes or cylinders or something. Like each one of those counts towards this like thirty thousand limit. Um, so you you've got like a limit there. You so you got to kind of be smart about it. Um, and then they have uh, they have like merge models where you just put it in this folder and then it basically makes all of the pieces count as like one thing, you know? So like the kit bashing isn't too much limitation that way. And the other one's networked object count. And I'll get into what a networked object is a little bit more in a minute. But basically these are objects that um, you want to be like synchronized for, for movement or something where it like moves around on the server and then um, everybody else that's observing sees that movement happen the same way, right? Um, so those objects are kind of expensive and uh, you're, you have like a, a very small budget of them. Um, so yeah, so with these two limitations, um, progressively over the last year and a half, uh, they've come out with updates that have improved it or there's like some crazy workarounds that I've had to uh, figure out on my own or the community has come up with and stuff. And um, yeah, and I think um, now like I said, like people can support games with quite a few players compared to the early days. Uh, yeah, and the last limitation to think about, and this is true of all multiplayer games, It um, and again, I wasn't aware about this either until I started using this because I didn't have a lot of multiplayer game uh, programming experience before core and it's helped me like learn a lot of the fundamentals and stuff um, 
how's it going? But something to be aware of in multiplayer games that I hadn't thought about is the amount of data coming across the network. So just anytime you send, you know, a bunch of players like, hey, like this person's wearing this skin, you know, like it's like you can represent it with like the full name of the skin, like uh, clown costume 49 or something like that, right? But but each one of those characters counts towards your, your bandwidth. So you want to try to figure out how to take that and turn it in, compress it into like one or two characters or something, you know what I mean? Um, so that's the other thing to think about. Yeah, so this is like all the technical stuff that uh, it was suggested to me, I get out of the way, but I thought it was important because um, the goal here is like I'm trying to help people that, again, that if you've done a little bit of multiplayer stuff with Unreal or Unity, trying to show like some of the weird like workarounds and stuff you do to, to kind of achieve a similar goal in core. Um, if, somebody, if somebody was to go home and pick it up like tomorrow and start using it. But um, anyway, so uh, core has these concept of contexts. And um, I'm not going to go into this whole chart. This is from their, their documentation. And if you really get into it, you can understand what all these different things mean. But I can summarize it as like, they, they, if you make one of these folders and you put like objects under, it uh, forces that object to either be like, if it's a client, if it's in a client context folder, which is this one with the little computer, it makes everything underneath that be like on the client side, right? And if you put it on the server context and everything inside that exists on the server. Um, so it's really helpful for a lot of stuff and uh, it's really important for building your strategy of how to um, how to separate and optimize things. And like I said earlier, generally with multiplayer, what you want to do is you want like all of your art and your sound effects and your pretty stuff to be on the client side as much as possible. You don't want uh, the server to be like bogged down with, with dealing with that stuff. Um, so this is communication channels. And this is, this is like um, how you can communicate between the client and the server. So in Unreal Engine, you have like, you have like replicated properties and um, some other weird events and stuff, but Core sort of, they simplify it and they have these different like tools that you can use for sending information back and forth. Um, the first one is resources. And this is stuff like, um, like levels for players, right? Like, um, they can only be integers, and uh, but they take one second to arrive at all the clients. All the clients can see it. It's replicated to all of them. So if you change a resource on one player, like their level, then every other player in the whole game um, receives that update. They're like, okay, this person's level five now or something. And it takes like uh, a full second for the other players to see that. So. It's useful for stuff that's not very time sensitive and that you know is going to be an integer. Um, like again, levels are the easiest example. Um, it's important, levels are like a good use for this too because everybody needs to know levels so you can look at like a player list and see, okay, like all these people are in this level. Um, and then the alternative to that is uh, something they add called private networked data. So it arrives much faster than uh, resources and um, it can be any kind of data at all. So it can be strings, it can be integers. Um, so it's really useful for most stuff. And that's pretty much what you use primarily. The catch to private network data, though, versus resources, that it is private. So only that person, you have to change it on the server. You're like, okay, this person, uh, in Puppet Masters, I use it for like what cards you personally like own, what like your abilities. And, um, yeah, and uh, so it's good for like tracking people's stuff that they own or something, but that isn't important for anybody else. Again, this ties into that principle of limiting how much data is coming across like the network. You know, you only want people to receive stuff that they need, like the minimum stuff that they need to know. You don't want to overwhelm them with, they don't need to know everybody's abilities, everybody's like skill builds or what, you know, what setup they have, only that person needs to know that stuff. Um, the other avenues they have are um, 
uh, dynamic properties. It's kind of, they used to call it something else, but it's basically, it's these, I'll show you guys actually in the editor, it's a little easier to see this screenshot turn out kind of grainy. But it's a, um, it's a string, like you can put a whole bunch of stuff in this, and you can view it in the editor while, over here. I actually just realized I didn't even play, I didn't even demonstrate my game to you guys at all at the beginning of this talk. I meant, I totally meant to do that, my bad. Um, but I'll go ahead and open the project here, and I can't play from the project, I'm gonna actually be faster and trying to load it on the live server. Um, they project like for for like optimizing like visual effects yeah, like so that they're like they don't they don't render when they're a certain distance I can I can show that um, maybe a little bit of a detour from the, the talk itself we could do that at the, at the end where I'm doing the interactive part or maybe I could just flip it on here I got to load the main scene that's the PvP map so yeah so here's uh, I'll go I'll try and show, demonstrate some of the stuff actually I was talking about it might be easier um, this so this is like your view of like the map, right? It's got the same like camera navigation and it's unreal where you can use WSD and you can hold shift to like sprint and like look around. This is the arena map that I just added for people. We're gonna have our first uh, PvP tournament actually in about a month. Um, and then this tab is this is a list of like all the maps that you want to tie together, right? So we're in the PvP arena. I'm gonna go load the main uh, main game. It's gonna take probably just a second. There you go. All right, so it's got to render all the foliage. Yeah, so what my brother's talking about is, um, and this exists in Unreal 2, again, uh, and Unity, of course, is uh, it's pretty common to have like different, different filters for viewing, like, you know, wireframe or something, but there's one for VFX cost. That's pretty cool. So you can see like these are the particle effects from the top of the waterfall. And you see it's pretty it's pretty heavy when you're close, but I have like a culling distance set on it, right? So if you go away, it just disappears eventually. All these little dots are like the VFX for like these spawn points and stuff. Yeah. Uh, I'll go ahead and hit play. I'm just gonna show you guys like one fight in the game actually. <laughs> I forgot to show that. This is the main town. It's called, the name of the game I was Puppet Masters again. Um, that's in the first slide, but this is the main town. It's called The Hollow. I felt like putting it in the pit because I just haven't seen that before in a game. Um, it actually turned out to be a blessing in disguise because the benefit of this town being a pit uh, Performance-wise, when we're outside of the pit, all those objects are like not getting rendered, and that's most of the objects. That's half the objects in the game is like that. That big cathedral is like a lot. Anyway, so you come out of the um, come out of uh, the town, and then this game is like it's a turn-based card game in an RPG. So you go to these like these are the spawn points, the enemies, and you step in. And I kind of jokingly call it like playing rodeo, rodeo with them. Right, you're in the pen and then they're chasing after you and you gotta try to, you can run from them or you get bit by them and then pull them in the fight and knock them right down. And then you've got these cards for, oh my gosh. Why do I have so many strong cards? It's gonna be one shot. And then uh, you got these cards and you rotate through and you put them on. And I don't know why all the cards are as strong as they would be. Oh, well. When you're defending, you use WSD to dodge on this grid. And then uh, you throw a card on it and it makes him do an attack. And boom, you just kill this guy. Pick up money. 
Anyways, yeah, it's like an MMO, so if we were on the live server right now, and there's other people playing, you see them running around, you can see their fights, uh, you can party up with people in groups of two or three, um, you can get dual people in PvP, all kinds of good stuff. We'll, we'll look at this more later. I'll get back to the talk, though. So here's an example of uh, those dynamic properties I was talking about. Um, I use them for like all the party configurations on the game, right? So when people like join parties or something, it takes one of these properties and then it changes it to a list of like player IDs separated by commas, you know, of who's in what parties and all that kind of stuff. So that's just an example of a use case for dynamic properties. Otherwise, they are kind of a weird abstract thing and just explain the text. Uh, the last thing that's important is events so again if you've used unreal you'd be familiar with um with events or most programming stuff um i think there's events in unity too but um events are like basically you send something like you fire something off like a broadcast and then you can set up all these things to subscribe to the event and like receive it and be like okay like something something changed you know, like player died that's a really good example so player, so I'd send player died event out, and then there's a lot of different things like respawning them or resetting like the cards or something, and you got to all these things have to respond and react to those events. Um, yeah, in core uh, events are important because they're the fastest way to send something back and forth from the client to the server and vice versa. It only takes about a tenth of a second for an event to arrive. Uh, it'll keep retrying if it fails. Um, you do have a budget on how many times you can send a message to the server or the client and it's 10 times per second per player uh, either way, um, which is quite a lot uh, because there's a lot of stuff you can communicate that's not very time sensitive through the other, other methods. Um, you know, like, I, I don't know, I, you have to be doing something wrong like having a, a machine gun that sends an event for every single bullet that lands or something to go over that budget which is a bad idea don't don't do that um some communication examples of puppet masters uh i just kind of showed some like i said resources are good for levels and they're good for like player state like uh whether or not somebody's in combat if they're asleep or resting or something those are like things that you can track with just an integer they're not super time sensitive and, but they're important stuff that everybody needs to know. Um, private network data is, um, again, it's good for stuff that only the player themselves needs to know, um, but the server has to keep track of for the sake of not letting people cheat. Like, what cards, what abilities they have in their, what items they have in their inventory, that's a good example, right? Like, you, you need to know that, and, um, and the server needs to be the only thing that's changing what items are in your inventory or people are gonna cheat. Um, dynamic properties, again, I just showed up good for like party configurations, uh, giving everybody a list of what cosmetic items people have equipped so that the client knows what art to display for, um, for people. And events are good for things that need to happen fast. Um, so I gotta use it for when the turns switch over in the fights. Um, this is kind of crazy too. I don't know how much we gotta get into this, but uh, I, it's probably better if I just show it more hands-on. Um, so an important thing with making new MMOs is you have like, you know, a lot, you have like databases of, of stuff, like all the items, right? The equipment, the um, cosmetic items or something, the, the abilities, all that stuff. So you have a lot of like static data that needs to be tr um, stored somewhere, like, you know, like um, how much experience it takes to get from this level to that level. Um, yeah, or in this case, like this is the cards. I'm gonna just show you guys here. Like the cards, they have like a lot of stuff. So basically what the point of that slide is, is I have like a database folder 
and it's just stored. I have stored as like actual literal objects in the hierarchy in uh, Core. But if I go to one of these cards, you see like this is all like the data that we that I have to store for for a single card. Like what ability it is, the name, the display name, uh, how the power scales on it. These are all the different colors for like the cards that you see in the UI, right? Like I have to um, store like what image it is um, that needs to be displayed, all the different colors, the icons with status effect. Um, so it's really nice in core to, uh, if you're gonna make something like an MMORPG um, to set up these like databases with all these properties here because then if you wanna change something, it's really easy, it takes two seconds. It's like, oh okay, like, uh, like I was balancing cards last week for PvP, and it was like uh, this this one's too strong or something. So I just come in here and, and change these numbers and then publish an update. So it's nice to have them all laid out like this. And then the other way that you can store a bunch of data in Core that they just added is data tables. So it's just you know like a it literally translates to a commerce separated spreadsheet, a CSV, and I find that. You can store a lot of the same stuff that I have here in spreadsheets, but um, I don't know. I, I like a mixture of, of both because uh, and there's kind of an extra step involved with looking at a, like opening a spreadsheet and trying to look at it here. It's not as it's not as clear as like swapping a bunch of stuff around on these folders. So that's how you store a big database of items in core. And uh, storing player and game data is pretty straightforward. They have, what time is it? All right. Um, again, they handle all the database stuff and they just have like, you just literally have like uh, set player storage and you just like write out like, you know, uh, save this level, save this item or something. Uh, I suggest, I highly suggest that the way we have a set up in Pub Masters is people's data when you log in, it gets all read in, and then when they log out or if they disconnect, it gets all, all written. Instead of doing it in pieces, like that's the alternative is, oh, every single time they level up, let's go update their permanent data storage. And I find that if you have like one control point for um, writing everything at once and reading everything at once and they're where it's permanently stored, it allows for, um, it allows just for more like flexibility and not like not as many things to go wrong like when you have stuff like updating in pieces in all these different places like a lot can go wrong you know um yeah so the publishing process uh once you have a, a game is very easy it's, it's a one button click like i was saying it took me five minutes yesterday to fix like an issue with the leaderboards um and publish an update uh people are able to jump right back into the game there's no downtime or maintenance and uh, it's allowed for many easy hot fixes or rapid balance tweaks. Um, when I just have like a group of players and they're online, they're giving me a bunch of feedback. I'm like, okay, let me fix this, let me change that, let me change that. And um, it's such an easy process to publish that it's really fun to just keep updating stuff. So, um, this is also technical for like uh, once you're once you have your game, it's important to set up like at least two different things. Uh, branches. So like, here's the source control for the game. Uh, really, I should have a third one, but I have like two branches, right? So you do all your work in like the dev branch, and then um, what's cool on core is uh, you can publish. So if I go to file, I go to publish. You see, I've got <laughs> this big warning here, and that's because I have two versions of the game. And the one on the dev branch is unlisted, the same way as like a YouTube video can be like unlisted, you know, or private, where people can't just like search it and find it. So my test version of the game that's running on their live servers um, is not accessible unless people have the link, um, which I don't give it out. And uh, that's important because the live servers, obviously they, they behave way differently uh, and have a lot more latency issues and stuff, compared to just hitting play in your editor. So you need a way to test the game on an actual uh, server environment, but you know, still have to be a test, like, uh, so you don't do anything. So nothing really bad happens. Like I literally, I was trying to test the PvP map last week, 
and I jumped in with one of my accounts on the testing and blew up my entire account. <laughs> I lost I lost everything, but that was the part, that was the reason for having a, a private test server, right? Is because I didn't want that to happen to any of my players that have put like 50 hours or 100 hours in the game. That would have been really bad. <laughs> um, so yeah, so once you once you have your game set up, um, there is there's a link. I I'll have to find it. If anybody is knows, you message me. I can send you a link. But or you can search it on their forums. They have a post about how you split up these branches on your source control uh, once your game's live. It's a pretty it's a pretty easy process. But I'm not going to go into the details of it right now. Um, once you have a two, then yeah, the process for um, for stuff is you, you make your changes here, and then you switch over to your live game branch, and then you merge the changes over. Okay, you like merge the changes, and then you um, and then you publish from your your master thing, and then that'll be the live game that is public that people are playing. Um, and then finally, once your game is up and running. They have these cool uh, tools for funnel analytics. I don't know if anybody here is familiar with that uh, that term, but um, funnel analytics are basically, you can, I like to picture it like when you drop a coin in one of those tornado looking things at like a museum or something, right? It's You're looking at how people are, um, be looking at their quit points basically, right? Like where they're getting stuck and then quitting and leaving the game. And so this is how you're seeing like your retention like over time, and um, you they, they have a drag and drop tool for this. I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll actually show you guys on the live game this this funnel, and I can explain some of it. Um, but yeah, so you, that stuff's important because uh, you would be really surprised at it doesn't matter how good of a designer you are, you're going to be super wrong about what kind of stuff people are gonna get tripped up on or get bored on and like give up at, you know what I mean? It's really, really surprising. And um, so you, with, with the funnel analytics though, you get like a real statistic of this percentage of player, of new players that have shown up in the, in the last batch of 500 or something, right? This percentage of players uh, didn't even start the first quest. It's actually a problem I have right now and I think Part of that is because there's, um, I think that particular instance, because there's like a lot of younger like kids coming from Roblox over here, and I don't think they've actually like ever done questing <laughs> in a video game before, so they don't know to talk to the NPC. But um, yeah, so I'm gonna jump in here, show you guys, it'll load. And then when you're done with this, so it does 500 at a time, right? Um, when you're done with this, you take screenshots of it, you save it, you categorize it, you know, so you can see like the timeline of how your new player experience is improving, right? Because like some of the, some of these numbers used to be really bad when I first launched the game. I had like no tutorial, I had no early game quests, people had no idea what they were doing, I was able to see all kinds of crazy bad things that were happening. Yeah, when you, once you sort of iron out your, your funnel, this is what you want to see, it's like three or four percent drops per step. Whenever you see double digit drop offs in your player uh, in your player amount, like that is uh, that's really bad. That's something that you probably want to prioritize fixing, like I said right here. Twelve percent of people quit the game before even accepting the first quest. And you get dropped off right in front of the NPC. So that's kind of crazy. So like the solution that I want to implement, for example, is um, forcing them to have to accept the first quest. Like they're forced into that conversation and they have to click the accept button. Um, completed the Fox quest. Actually, this is an interesting one. I, I've seen, I know what's going on with that one too. So it's like, it's always a process of improving it. But what's interesting, yeah, so long-term players, only 3% have stuck around. And what's interesting that I've learned from this, I learned this from uh, people, staff that work at Manticore that have been in the industry for for a while, for like a decade or more, you know, and have done this stuff, uh, but mobile games and stuff, they, they imparted their wisdom uh, to us during the accelerator that was part of the program, it was cool. Uh, apparently it is normal for even the biggest AAA games, even ones that people have paid for, apparently, for 5% of people to quit before even completing the first step in the game, which is wild. 
Um, so that's pretty standard. And then losing like three to five percent of people at each step along the way is also normal. And especially for free to play, again, even major AAA games, the the goal that they hope for in long term retention of people putting like coming back for like a week or like 100 hours playing the game is three to six percent. Um, so it seems bad, but it's actually it's pretty standard. You know, interestingly enough. Yeah, so that's that's something cool. Um, another thing, I don't know why it's not cool. Close. Another thing that's interesting, but I can't really show right now because there's no other players. That's another cool drag and drop tool. Is one called um, User Study. And uh, what User Study does is it lets you see the camera perspective of players as they're playing, so you get to spy on them. And um, that also helps you find like crazy stuff that. That you won't believe. Like I've seen, I've seen people like skip the first quest and everything. They go straight to trying to fight the hardest enemies, or they go and they find like sometimes some person like one in a hundred people they find like the most hidden secret passageway in the entire game in the first like five minutes, and then they get stuck on like the simplest thing and then they leave. So um, yeah, you see all kind of range of uh, of issues, and it's especially useful. Um, when it's paired with those funnel analytics, so you can watch somebody and you're like, okay, like they're not, in my case, like the Fox Quest, I figured out what's going on because it's like, hey, if they're going through the tutorial, they got to this quest, and I see what they're doing now, and I'm just sitting there and watching, I see, oh, they, they didn't even figure out that the other blue spawn points are also foxes and they quit or something. So those two in conjunction with each other are awesome. And again, I want to emphasize that those are available through this thing called the community content which this is all free. This is all free stuff that people in the community have made or um, or Manticore has a contractor company called Team Meta that they uh, hire and pay to develop some of these awesome free to use drag and drop tools in it, right? So there's like inventory systems and all this stuff. And like the PC kit, yeah, here's like you know, user study. Yeah. I didn't show up. Let's go look up funnel. There you go. So here's the Team Meta, so it's developed by Team Meta, the contract team. Team Meta Final Analytics, and again, you just literally click Import, and then they all come with some nice uh, readme's, and they are um, they set all the stuff up from the community content, the drag and drop solutions. They try to set all of it up where it's no code involved at all. So they're like no code solutions, you read the readme, and then they put, um, you gotta find my funnel, 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 uh, we'll look, oh, analytics, here we go. Um, so they put a nice little readme in, and then they have, um, and then they have like uh, just properties here. And the readme says like, you know, add add your account ID to the admin list for this. And there you go. And then it'll work for you. And you're a GM on it. You know, set your uh, set your sample size, all this stuff. And again, you don't have to look at any of the code that goes into this tool to be able to manipulate it and use it. And that extends beyond these technical dev tools. They have this these kinds of no code tools um, for um, for all kinds of things like inventory and items dropping and um, enemies spawning and attacking and stuff. Um, so a lot of games on core are made by people that really like have almost no coding experience that came into it. It's cool. Um, Puppet Masters, uh, though, if you want to make something that has like some really interesting or unique like gameplay, then you do have to start digging into the code a little bit. Um, so yeah, Th this game actually, interesting enough, the other programmer that I work with on my team, he looked and he, he did something on GitHub where he was able to see the numbers and he found out it's like it's 65,000 lines of, of Lua code right now. It's pretty crazy. Anyways, uh, that's, that's the end of that. I think we have like 15 minutes left, hopefully? Yeah, roughly 15 minutes. Um, yeah, that, that's uh, that's the, the PowerPoint part, which is probably more boring than the hands-on part, but here's some links. Uh, this is Core's official uh, website, if you want to go download it. Um, this is my link tree for my game company. It's called Null Drums. And um, yeah, there's the links to like the games on there, um, my, my Twitch stream, the official website. I stream every day of development on the game. I'm up to, I think the last stream I did, uh, like on Monday was day, or Sunday was day 445. Uh, so I've been working on this for a year and a half. Uh, the art 
and then uh, I do some art stuff too, and so there's the link tree for that. Um, yeah, that's cool. Uh, if anyone has any questions about how anything's done specifically, let me know. Um, if not, I think some cool things to talk about too is also like, uh, I can't emphasize enough the importance of core, like, like how I'm making an MMO, I made most of this, I made about 80 to 85% of this by myself in a year and a half. And there's like no other tool out there really that lets somebody make a game this complex and with this much multiplayer going on in a short period of time like that. Um, I think that's the last important thing to, to mention. But yeah, floor is open. Yes? Um, I have one question about, I, I don't have a game design background, so I guess one question, but in core, do you work with others, or can you work with others? So say I have me and two other friends that we're going to try to make a game together. How does this yeah. control work? Yeah, um, so they use GitHub. So that's what I was showing you. This this is the same as GitHub Desktop. This is just a paid tool. It's called Get Kraken. It's got a little nicer interface. But um, yeah, like if I open up GitHub Desktop, like a project's in there too. Um, they have like again, it's like a one button click like setup. It's on their documentation. Let me see if I can find it. Um, core documentation. Search GitHub. What you cannot do though, that, that Roblox does have apparently, that I've heard, is you can't like uh, build the map together at the same time like in multiplayer. Like it's pretty crazy. I've been waiting for that to be a feature in game engines for the last like decade. And apparently Roblox has that, and that's one of the most requested features from all the kids coming over from Roblox. Like, can I build a map with friends? Which is really cool, but so I don't know if that's on the horizon or not. I would hope it is. But in general, you just use GitHub. Here's their tutorial for it. Um, it's, is this tutorial for it? Oh yeah, this, I'm at the bottom of the page, that's why. Working with teams, yeah, so they have, their documentation is awesome, by the way. Their API is awesome. You can pretty much just stumble through, and I figured most of the stuff out through that, and, and their Discord is great. They have um, Ask Anything and Lua help channels if you want specific programming help, and there's uh, awesome people in there that are just rapid fire answering questions all day, so. Yeah, so um, if you want to figure that out, go to their documentation and just search GitHub and you'll find this Collaboration Core. This article um, will tell you how to set it up, but it's, uh, let me go through, getting okay, support, working with teams, management program design, art, useful tool. I don't know where it went. I don't know, somewhere in here you can find the search. Uh, oh, right here, GitHub tutorial. GitHub and Core. Um, So you install it, add the project. Yeah, you just do file, add, so you make your map, and then you navigate, you do file, add, local repository, and then you find your map folder in core, and you just click go. <laughs> it's uploading, that's pretty much it. Uh, yes? Uh, what do you use for your monetization model? Like, how exactly are you making money on Oh, yeah, true. I didn't touch on that at all. There's just, there's so many parts to it. Um, so they have, they have, it's called their perks program, and you, you do have to apply to get accepted into their monetization, um, but it's pretty, if you have a cool game and a proof concept, it's pretty easy to get in. Um, and once you have, once you're in, then I'm looking for perks manager. Here you go. So here's all of, perks is their, their term for like a cash shop item or something, right? So here's the list of all the perks and puppet masters, uh, right? Here's like the helm, the gloves, the shoulder for like the gatekeeper set, for example. They have different types when you make them. Uh, we could go to like create and perk here. Yeah, but yeah, you set like the type if you want it to be something that people can keep purchasing. Permanent is like a cosmetic item, right? Because you want them to have it forever. Um, and uh, limited time is like my a subscription, right? So the VIP membership lasts for 30 days. They can't buy a second one while that timer is running, you know, so it handles a lot of that stuff for you. Um, and then um, you set the price in terms of core credits here. So like a lot of my stuff's like still priced like $2, $5, $10. Um, 
Yeah, and then once you once you created it, you know, if you go to create and you can enable the prompt, yeah, here's the prompt, super easy, right? Permanent, limited time, repeatable, price and credits, name of it. And then once you have it, they have um, something in core content is uh, this tab. This is the built-in like stuff, like the 3D objects and stuff that you can use and drag and drop. Uh, one of the UI elements, I think it's down here, one of the key UI elements, these are like text boxes, buttons, Maybe it's platform tools. I don't know. I usually just search everything. Uh, perk. Yeah, so they have um, a perk purchase button. So we can drag in there. That's what it looks like. So it's like standardized, you know, they want it to look uniform across all games. Um, but this has its own in the API. It has, you might as well pull up the API if you're asking questions. Like I said, I like, I like their API a lot. It's very nice. Here's all their classes. Um, we go down to UI, perk purchase button. You know, they got all this great stuff built in for it, for uh, getting a reference, the click event, you know, purchase, blah, 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 fires off. Um, and so like I said, uh, part of what's built in about it and why they have it as this universal button is all, again, all the like verification stuff to make sure somebody's not like cheating or they spam click the button. You don't have to like deal with preventing it's all like handled for you. Yep. Yes. Uh, how similar is the course programming to like other engines like Unreal? Is it like have block programming or is it a code based? Oh, the programming? Uh, it's Lua. So um, I don't know how familiar you are with Lua, but Lua is a scripting language, right? So there's no compile times. Uh, same thing as like writing in C Sharp and Unity. Um, but Lua is designed to be a nice compile free, easy to use scripting language that sits on top of an engine that's in C++. So um, Roblox uses it for their stuff, but some big companies that use it is like Blizzard uses uh, Lua, like all of their uh, designers and stuff, when they're like scripting like a raid boss uh, fight or something like that, they're, they're doing it in Lua. And um, uh, Destiny 2 and Bungie, they use Lua, so again, they script like boss fights and events that are happening in the world and stuff. The designers interact with the engine by, by just writing Lua scripts. And this is what it looks like, this is Lua. Um, it's super easy to use. I had not used it uh, like at all before getting into this. I just knew it existed for writing like add-ons for WoW and stuff. And um, yeah, you can see it's super clean. Like there's no there's no curly brackets, there's no semicolons. So it's on par with like Python in terms of like syntax, like how simple it looks. Uh, it is not white space sensitive like Python. So like the number of indentations you have or something doesn't matter. Um, so I after using this, I think Lua is honestly the easiest programming language for for somebody to use that's never programmed in their life. I would say like the next the easiest thing possible for somebody that's doing game dev is their program is probably Blueprints in Unreal, right? With like visual scripting. And then I'd say the next easiest thing below that is scripting stuff in Lua. And then at least with Lua, you're like looking at syntax and stuff. So it's kind of good good training for um, eventually going on and do C or something. Yeah? Any other questions? Yeah? Um, so Yeah. And in media content, we saw that it was like the first person thing. Yeah. Do, do people make like platformers or kind of strategy games? Like, or, or is it kind of central around the third? No. So, fortunately, again, that's part of why I dove into this stars. I worked on Fortnite Creative and I saw like how limited that was, right? You are stuck in that uh, with the third person perspective and you can't, you can't do any gameplay you want. With Court, you can. Uh, totally start from a blank project and you do any gameplay you want. There's no like RTS games on it yet. Like if you want to make one, go for it. There needs to be some. Uh, nobody's really taking on a challenge. I've been threatening to. <laughs> like somebody could make like a little mini MMO RTS, which has never been done because of how like daunting of a task that is technically. Uh, but that's another concept I've been dreaming of, you know, ever since playing like StarCraft. But um, but yeah, so you can see if you go to a new project, they have these good frameworks, so 
uh, if you want to get started on stuff, so they have like this one has a, a bunch of working gather calls and inventory, and you can you can uh, create a copy of these frameworks, and you can just like like you can just grab a lot of functionality from it, just copy paste the scripts over to like other projects. Um, yeah, they have like farming game framework, they have like deathmatch, a dungeon crawler, they have top down battle royale, so they have these frameworks for starting. Um, but yeah, if you actually know what you're doing and you're familiar with programming and stuff, you can start from an empty project and you can um, totally forego even having a, a player. Like I said, I made a, I made a 32 player chess lobby. I was going to find, uh, they have an, this example game, Mergelandia, is a, um, it's like one of those Merge 3 games, you know, so it's like top down and like a little puzzle thing or something. Um, yeah, so anything's possible. Gameplay wise. What's up? Along with that, uh, so you had that stop script that just made it like you turn it from a person game into a turn-based. Oh, for doing turn base? Yeah. Yeah, there's no clear like framework for, for turn base yet, but yeah, the concept is I mean turn base is easy. It's easier. The hard stuff's when it's time sensitive, like real time action, because they can the latency of the server, or somebody being connected all the way to uh, Eastern Europe and South America and North America, all trying to like play at the same time, like that gets hard uh, with real time stuff. The turn base is easier. You kind of just have to start from scratch, and then I, I suggest like I use the private network data stuff uh, to sort of dictate like what state the game is in, uh, since it's not so time sensitive. Anyways, I I'm not a good place. I was just trying to show a different perspective. Yeah, so you see, this is a Merge 3 game, right? There's no, there's no player, there's no camera, there's no movement. Anything's possible. Yeah. Come on. Ah, there we go. Any other questions? Go for it. For the assets, you said all the assets in the game, in order to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish, are all three set. You can't bring in any units. Yeah. How big, in your experience, is the asset library versus like genres of me? So, like, I saw a lot of fantasy looking type stuff, but hey, is that kind of where it's sequestered? I can show you, but let's just go through the whole library now. It is, um, it's not a huge amount of stuff, but Man, the, the people that I know in the community that are artists in it, that spend all day, every day, like, kid bashing art, they come up with, like, crazy stuff. And I'm like, how do they do that? Because, like, I tried the other day, I was trying to make an armor set for the Rogue, and it was terrible. <laughs> it looked like a, a wooden apple with, like, a bunch of bits and, and bobs on it. But, um, go over here to 3D objects. Here's, like, the whole thing. There's like all of them. So there's like these neon signs. A lot of these basic, most people when they make something that are really good at it, they do it almost all with basic shapes. So it's kind of like sculpting or something, you know, like they have an eye for how to combine these basic shapes that just have like a grid material. And um, something cool is they have, they have smart materials. So like if you have like a wood floor and you just put like a bunch of cubes together and you just check smart material, it makes them all like seamless, you know, instead of having like mismatched uh, wood panels or something like that. So that's really, that's part of what allows and makes possible making all these crazy things out of simple, uh, simple objects. I can actually have a pretty funny uh, example. We had a Halloween event, or no, we had a Thanksgiving event. And I made <laughs> this NPC, this is inspired by Pelodi's Pizza Hog from the TV show Invader Zoom. I made uh, this, this big pig with a suit on and uh, he's almost all basic shapes. And he's called the Blood is Hog, and he was for the Thanksgiving event where people were getting, uh, they got like turkey legs as drops, and um, <laughs> and like uh, corn cob and stuff. So you can see like, like his buttons are like diamonds, like a gold material, and then like his bib is, in, is like, um, it's like a potato chip basic shape that's like flattened out, you know what I mean? And um, I'm not doing anything crazy here on materials. Like I said, like my friends that, that do stuff, they're doing 
they do some very um, much more impressive stuff than what, than what I can do here. But yeah, so it's, it's limited. There's, um, you're asking about themes specifically. They have like Japanese, you know, fantasy, they have sci-fi, they have military, um, yeah. Any other question? How many hours do you have? Well, I'm at day 445, and I, most of those days I average between 20, 10 and 12 hours. So by my estimates, I think it's like 4,500. <laughs> it's been a crazy year now. What's up? Show a basic shape of moving on A basic shape? Maybe it's just on part of him. Uh, oh, part of him? Yeah, but maybe like part of him. I mean, I guess, I guess so. But I think, let's see. We can go down here. Yeah, see, like apple. So his body, I started with basic apple. You know, and just made it like pink. And then when you drag a basic apple in, it's maybe more like uniform. You know, like you know, I, I turned it, I turned it upside down to get that body uh, shape on him, and uh, yeah, just like scaled it and stuff. You know. Yeah. Any other questions? Did I overwhelm you guys? So I. <laughs> yeah. What about like? Oh, the animation is interesting. Um, there's, so they have, um, we, we designed, we developed, we have our own patented Noldrum's uh, animation tool. And actually, um, uh, it was used for uh, the other program I work with him and the guy that designed our Battle Pass. I helped, I helped them link up for the latest game jam that happened uh, in March. And they end up winning the grand prize, and I think a good part of that's because we have our custom animation tools, but um, and nobody else does right now, so it's, so our stuff kind of stands out. But um, the the options are you have over here in core content, the the built-in stuff, you have animated meshes, so you have access to like raptors. Um, they, there's not a lot; they just add spiders. The spiders cool, right? Ooh, he's cool. Um, and uh, like they have like a fox and like humanoids and stuff. And what people do um, is they kit bash on top of these, right? So you have a list of preset animations these can all play, like attack or walk or something. But you can, a lot of these cases, you can disguise, you know, like the raptor or the fox. You can pile so much stuff on them that they don't resemble a raptor or a fox or a spider anymore. And um, so that's the most common way of doing animation. Um, so the other two alternatives are um, our in-house tools that we developed is um, similar to, I basically, when I was specking it out, I'm like, I just want the Unity animation editor but in core. Because they added last summer, they added curves, right, as like a property. So let me go to, let me show you my bear. So they added curves, so basically all it is, is we just have like a, a series of curves, right, with keyframes and stuff, just like any animation editor. Um, that, um, so here's like our bear, right? And no, there's no bear in core, uh, nobody else has a bear. And uh, so we had to do all the animation, I, animations custom. And I just set them up with the folders, right? The folders are basically joints, you know, for the skeleton. So like we've got root move, root animation, and then we've got like the head and the front, the left leg and all that. So um, what I mean by joints is they're just like the pivot point, right? So the, the folders are, let me turn the camera sensitivity down. The folders are positioned where I want the joints to be, you know what I mean? Uh, so like this, so if I move front left leg, like it's pivoting where you'd expect front left, left leg to. Uh, you know, we don't have, one downside, we don't have IK like handles or anything with this. Um, but um, yeah, so like that's how he moves and how he's rigged. And then I can show you what like his uh, his run animation looks like. If I go to my database, we've got animation database. We've got the, the bear. And then I can go to like his uh, melee walk, right? And I go here and we've got all these curves on him for um, the, each joint. So like the root and the body and the head, they've each got a curve for um, the XYZ position and the XYZ rotation and the scale. If I go click edit here, um, you can see 
Yep. All right. I'll highlight all of them so you see this cra this craziness. It's a little clunky, right? Yeah, so here's all the curves for the, for the walk animation on the bear. Um, it took me four days to make this animation. Uh, it's pretty crude right now, is the summary, and it's for our custom setup. But Manticore's head of their, um, the head of their technical art department, um, he's played the game a couple times, and he hangs out on the street. And I got to show him our solution in like January, and it sounded like it inspired him a lot. And he like immediately went and was getting to work on something. So hopefully, they give us a little more official support for like what we're trying to do down the line. The main thing I told them, there's like a, a, some weird things like. I want to be able to color code these lines. You know, like traditionally X, Y, Z is color coded like red, green, blue. And so it's really hard to look at when you're looking at a wall of orange. So hopefully they, they do some stuff to sort of more integrate and make this officially supported um, rather than what we've done in our hacky way here. The other, and then the third way that some really legit people have done, there's, there's a couple, there's this one super awesome uh, indie game team that's made like legit indie games in Unity that was a part of the Accelerator last summer. They um, they had the knowledge that uh, apparently you can take like the templates in core and you can import them in Blender. And they wrote in Python, they wrote their own plugin to rig the, the core template up for the, they have these robot characters and it rigs the character up automatically in Blender and they were able to export the animations back in core somehow. So there's a couple really pro, they're, they're the only team I know that's successfully done it. Somebody has an attempt at doing that Blender plugin that's in the community content, but it was broken last time I tried it. So that is possible if you really know what you're doing uh, with uh, pretty much any regular 3D modeling package in Python. I'm not sure how the exporting of the core templates works, but their templates in core is like prefabs and unity, you know, or something like, like your preset, like save, like group of objects or something. Um, they're all written in um, JSON. So that's how people would figure out these weird ways of manipulating them outside of the editor. You just mess with the JSON file. So, yeah. So all of those are basically kind of uh, set up as prefabs kind of combined together to create insane characters. Yeah, well like, uh, what I mean by templates, like my, the whole bear, the whole bear, the way you see this dark blue, the dark blue is templates. So I mean like the whole the whole bear is um, is, is like a template because I want to be able to spawn him at like runtime, you know, and just all at once as a package. Yeah, as I say, I just realized we're 10 minutes over time. It is lunchtime. If anyone wants to keep asking me questions or you can keep going, I was Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you.